let's uh, let's kick this off. I think let's kick this off. Uh, uh, we have enough people that joined. Uh, I think uh, people will always be able to join as we move along. Uh, so for everyone that's uh, with us, thank you for joining. Uh, we are going to have a fireside chat open conversation. Uh, this evening we have Darren Jordan who is joining us, who has joined us. He's the managing director of Bitco EMEA. Uh, from Nebius we have Peter Woodard, who is our CEO, and uh, myself, Michael Stroyev. I'm the COO and head of product of Nebius. Uh, we're going to be having an open conversation on several topics. One is uh, crypto market trends. Where is crypto going? Where is Bitco going? It's going up, it's going down. There's a lot to talk about. Uh, crypto back loans and how that in the industry is influencing Bitcoin, crypto, and generally speaking, the banking industry. Uh, and cryptocurrency custody, right? How is that helping uh, to ensure and secure loans? And how is that, again, uh, influencing the market industry overall? Uh, open conversation. Uh, it's going to be, again, unscripted. <laughs> we'll see how it goes and where it goes. Uh, to give a very quick introduction uh, about Nebius, I'll start. Um, for everyone who has joined and for our users, welcome. Uh, Nebius is a platform that bridges crypto and cash. But what does that mean? Um, our main product is crypto-backed loans, right? So we allow people that have invested in cryptocurrencies to use those cryptocurrencies to get instant cash in the form of loans, all right? So, Keep hodling, don't sell your crypto, get cash for your everyday, everyday needs. In addition to that, we offer, offer a variety of financial services and additional crypto services. Go to our platform if you're not a user, check us out, create an account, we're amazing. <laughs> uh, we are purely B2C focused, so we're consumer focused. And uh, Darren from BitGo is B2B focused. And I think Darren is the best person to talk about BitGo. So. Darren. Thank you. Yeah, and first of all, thank you very much for inviting me in. Um, it's super, super pleasure here to, to be joining the panel. Um, yeah, I'm sure many people are familiar with, with BigGo. Um, you know, we've been a, around since 2013 as a, as a wallet provider. Um, over the last few years, actually, we've we've kind of moved more into you know, what we would say is bringing trust into the industry from an institutional perspective. So as, as Michael mentioned, BitGo is primarily uh, business to business. We face institutions. Um, you know, the ultimate goal here is to enable our our clients to navigate what we say is a complex you know, landscape of digital assets in a compliant and secure manner. Um, and that includes wallets, custody, and also uh, prime services. So um, yeah, thank you very much for being. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Um, again, to touch to touch on risk, obviously there is a lot of there was a lot of risk associated with the crypto industry. There still is. A lot of people are still, uh, let's say, skeptical about the whole thing. Um, Derek, if I can just, again, ask you, uh, in, in your opinion, how are you guys, let's say, helping uh, to make the industry more secure, better? Um, if you, Again, just a few words on it. Yeah, I mean, one of the, one of the challenges that you know, in institutions, but also you know, anyone coming into this space is, you know, how to how to get exposure, how to safely buy um, crypto, and then you know as soon as you bought the asset, how do you store it? And you know, we know there are you know, plenty of different ways that you can store the Bitcoin. Um, the the issue that institutions face in particular is that you know, having it in a in a handheld device or, or or ledger device or at an exchange um, just isn't compliant um, with what an institution's used to. So you know, this. This kind of brings in a whole concept of custody, um, specifically in a, in a regulated framework, to kind of bring that comfort level to these guys. But you're absolutely right. Security is the single most important part um, of you know, actually holding and, and a digital asset. Yeah, because I mean, hacks still happen. And I mean, one of the more, like uh, things that we were talking together about with uh, Peter, who's on the call is the cover hack, uh, which is a, pr a pretty famous hack that happened recently, Peter. I think you can enlighten everyone about that one. <laughs> yeah, so we have we have a lot of conversations, both kind of internally and externally about sort of the conversation of, you know, CFI versus DeFi. Um, you know, with, with DeFi sort of uh, over 2020, really seeing 
um, some incredible growth. Um, and you know, companies like like us uh, versus more kind of you know you know DeFi protocols um, that also do kind of you know lending and, and borrowing and other more uh, advanced financial tools. Um, sort of you know how do how do they stack up? And you know you know where's the security uh, around it, or where's sort of the, the vulnerabilities? Um, and sort of when we when we talk about that, we talk about CFI and, and don't kind of shy away from the fact that since sort of the, the genesis of, of crypto, there's been um, a lot of exchange hacks. Um, a lot of this has been sort of um, internal governance issues um, and also technical issues as well, which were like the Mt. Gox and like an exchange hack where there was a vulnerability inside like the entire sort of infrastructure of, you know, said exchange or, or said protocol. Um, and, you know, with, with the cover hack, which was, um, you know, nicely lines up with this conversation about, about insurance and about both C5 versus DeFi is you had an issue with the smart contract, which is essentially in this case, like the entity or, or, or the governance. So um, it's kind of ironic. So if, if, if anyone doesn't know cover, so cover was a protocol, DeFi protocol spun out, to be an insurance protocol for um, for smart contracts that are being issued as you know new products or new companies, right? And what happened here is that there was a vulnerability in their smart smart contract where a hacker, albeit ethical, because they gave back the the tokens, they had a a bug that would allow someone to mint unlimited tokens, so they could you know have a billion tokens and dump them on the market. Um, and it kind of brings up the question in the context of, of insurance is like, who insures the insurer? Um, that was one of the questions because cover is meant to be the insurer. They got hacked and, you know, it was given back. And I don't know where the token's gone, but, you know, obviously it dived after that. Uh, could be a dead project for, for all I know. But in the context of like a, a CFI, um, like a BitGo, um, you know, and with Nebius is, you know, we use Bitco's infrastructure for insured cold storage. They provide that infrastructure and the insurance is um, given by uh, a consortium, you know, driven by, by Lloyds of London, who is the insurer for the insurance, so to speak. So um, I think it, it nicely highlights um, where we are now in terms of like that C5 versus DeFi security debate. Um, I think what DeFi is doing is, is really great for like a test basis, in my opinion, for like financial tools and kind of growing the ecosystem as a whole. Uh, but in terms of at least where I put my my hard earned money, then having like a an entity that's regulated and sort of proven uh, gives me a bit more comfort or go to sleep comfortable at night. Right. But DeFi has seen, I think, if I'm not mistaken, one of the biggest years uh, 2020 in uh, trading and everything. Uh, it's just it be becoming super popular. Uh, for probably multiple reasons, right? But uh, I, th I think it's kind of spinning off of people um, learning about cryptocurrencies, learning about Bitcoin, and learning about Satoshi, and learning about decentralization as a whole, right? And thinking that, oh, well, uh, these guys are CFI, they're kind of like institutions like banks, let's, what about DeFi? Um, and I think it's also an, an issue of like DeFi becoming more accessible to people, right? It, it like, uh, Right now, you have a lot of these um, projects that merge both worlds, right? Are kind of CFI, DeFi ish, right? But are still DeFi. They have a very DeFi ish look. And I think that's attracting people. And I think that's that's kind of the trend that's happening, right? Yeah, there, there is merging. Sorry, Darren, you go on. Yeah, no, I was going to say, you know, it's a very interesting point where you say um, you know, the traditional financial markets, which is my background. Um, Historically, you know, these type of products, um, the yield enhancing products, have only been available for the you know, very exclusive, the ultra high worth individuals. And here you have a protocol which is you know, the average man on the street uh, can actually have um, access to these products. Um, so it's not just the private bankers; it's not you know, the, the the elite. Um, and I, I think that is that is huge in, in its own way because it gives you know, power to, as you, as you rightly say. Um, you know, whether it's the unbanked, whether it's the you know, the individuals that just want to test the market, understand how it works. You know, this is bring, you know, a, 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 a product um, that is available to all. Yeah, we were speaking of that before. Is I think one you know the, one of the promises of um, a blockchain or, or or I'd say blockchain as a as a whole was to let's say bank the unbanked or give financial services 
to people um, that couldn't get them for whatever reason. Um, you know, mostly because of you know where they live, it's just too expensive to to use these services. It doesn't make sense when you're kind of um, you know hand to mouth, or it's just you know you can't you can't reach them essentially. But you know, for for like the normal crypto user, uh, and this is sort of filtered down, is if you wanted to lend or take a loan against your assets, um, you would most likely need to be at a level where you're you know have a private banker or have you know, a really solid basis to, to lend against. And that could be you know, stocks or art or other things in your portfolio. Um, and for companies um, that Bitco is driving and, and, and companies like Nebius, that sort of tools is with someone that has 10, 15, $20 worth of crypto assets all the way up to, you know, millions of crypto dollars of crypto assets, which again, I think one of the, that kind of has filtered down the promise of, you know, of giving these financial tools to people that would normally have that, uh, mm -hmm. which is a, is a great thing to see. Yeah, and, and, and bring in the whole ethos of the blockchain and, and Satoshi's vision um, yeah, completely. I, I find it a little bit ironic that yeah, BitGo started off and, and still very much is, you know, we, we're, we're kind of centralizing that whole um, decentralized network. And, and that's, yeah, that is, really to bring institutions into the space where because it's needed to build that you know, infrastructure out to build the, you know, the credibility into the wider ecosystem but it's not excluding the um you know, the, the individuals uh, you know, it, i think that's where it works very well is you have this system where yes you can have a custodian you can have them hold the the key material it can be insured or as an individual, I can create my you know, own wallet on a, on a website and, and have five dollars worth in. Um, they they coexist together, which I think is, is unique. Um, and, and I think the same with CFI DeFi. I think yeah, there's there's positive and negatives on both. I mean, you, we we talk about you know, CFI being you know, centralized. Um, you know, there's um, there's an accountable business behind it where there isn't obviously on the DeFi platform. Um, and, but the DeFi, you've got absolute transparency. But I think they coexist together. Um, I think you've just seen the big growth there in DeFi. It's got a lot of headlines um, because that was a talking point of last year. Yeah. Well, it went from like what, you know, um, nothing to like, you know, over 2 billion locked in, locked in value over time, which in, in the grand scheme of things isn't huge amount, but it is a very sort of impressive um, new kind of vertical or new sort of way to do decentralized governance for you know what could be a company and there will be i'm sure um you know players that like an ave or compound or similar that do come out of this and sort of e evolve um you know i think we all we all come from a regulated background and my question is is like it's it's again a great sort of sandbox to try these things but how does a regulator even tackle something that has no governance structure in terms of like a formal one, nor does it have maybe even people that are, you know, acting on behalf. It's, it's strictly just sort of like a, a wallet that holds tokens, how they, how they tackle that. I have no idea. Yeah. No, that's an interesting point. Um, but again, like going back to like the whole idea of decentralization, I think when it originated, right. Um, one of the key ideas as well right is that you don't need that middleman and that it's it's hack proof your your wallet is hack proof no one can access it um that's it so again first question is it hack proof <laughs> right second question so is it is it a problem more about hacking or is it is it a problem about human error so where where does the where, where does the problem lie hacking human error or something in between I think I think some of the if you look at some of the largest hacks that we've seen, certainly at exchange level, um, you know, it's it's a lot of that is insider collusion, um, which is which is a we we would say in kind of the insurance world you'd put that as crime um, rather than hacking. Um, but you know, the bottom line is there are a lot of protocols and a lot of exchanges that have been built by um, either financial uh, service uh, people that come from financial services or technology without the fundamental understanding of how you secure um you know, how, how cryptography works and I, I think from bitcoin's perspective yeah that's why we kind of did it slightly different we started from you know, the securing of the assets and the technology um before moving into custody um, and that was important 
uh, rather than doing it the other way around. Um, but I, I think it's you know it's it's split evenly between where the risk lies. I mean the bottom like it, to put it bluntly, you have a private key, you can do lots with it, um, you can lose it, it you get stolen. Um, it, the, the the most important thing here that that is you know the in essence what where the, the owner of the asset because that private key gets in the wrong hand then yeah that asset's gone it's immutable you can't it's not like a chargeback where you can call the bank up and they'll say oh well, we'll refund you because you paid the bank the wrong way or we do a guarantee um so there there's some of the challenges and i think that's why insurance is so important um but yet again insurance in itself is is tricky because the industry is still in its infancy um you know, we, we're lucky to have underwriters and syndicates that are at lloyd's um the, the bottom line is is that capacity for insurance is still very very low um you, know, you can't get a, a billion dollar policy um, and if you could underwrite that risk the, the cost would be extortionate um so you know, that industry itself is still learning you know, they're still quantifying risk they're still looking at track record they're tr trying to understand what does a hack look like? Um, and that's that's also a challenge as well. Yeah, and I guess it's really difficult for, I'm, I'm thinking about one um, hack that happened recently that's you know, incredibly elaborate. So if I can remember correctly, and it was another DeFi um, project, but the, the hacker gained access remotely to the, I think it was like the CEO or the lead devs computer installed a fake version of MetaMask on his computer, then copied the keystrokes of the uh, the password and other things from MetaMask, and then logged into MetaMask and drained, <laughs> drained the entire wallet, um, which is incredibly elaborate and how insurance companies even put that into a policy, uh, apart from, as you mentioned, Darren, sort of, you know, the crime insider you know types of uh, of thefts or hacks is, is beyond me I, I don't know how they kind of and they probably won't put that into a policy uh, mm. not for a long time mm. crime i mean crime is um certainly our policy is um does have a crime element to it um it's actually split in two different ways there's a, a crime component um and what we call species component um and species insurance is you know, the physical storage of the asset in a vault um and crime is as, as you say it's the inside occlusion or or some kind of um you know hacking hacking risk um that that crime policy exists in the traditional financial markets so they've just ported that over um yeah, whether it's fiat whether it's crypto uh, the actual stealing of the private keys would fall under the species so by blending those two components together um you get a pretty solid you know, insurance policy but Listen, the bottom line is we're in the unknown because you know no one's made a claim of any significant size. You know, how does the insurance companies deal with that? Um, yeah, it's very early stage. But I think from a legal framework and certainly from insurance perspective, the biggest challenge is for a counterparty to get insurance. That mm -hmm. is the biggest, that takes a year of due diligence. Um, and you know, the, the risk and the underwriting teams need to be comfortable that they can price this risk. Um, and that's the biggest endorsement of a custodian to actually have insurance in the first place, because it proves that your operational aspects, you know, the, the, the processes behind the scenes and the security have met a threshold that even insurance companies are happy writing risk um, on, on an asset class, which you know, clearly is, uh, is very volatile. So, uh, again, um, I think that the, only, the only way to get through that is to have a centralized entity. That it's impossible to be a DeFi project and, and, and say, hey, insure me. Uh, again, with all the compliance, with all the due diligence, uh, it's, it, it would be impossible. Yeah, and I, I guess to some degree, it, it, we look at kind of like, you know, RAP WBTC um, as being you know, a, an instrument that really fueled a lot of the, um, you know, the, the, the DeFi market because it bring in Bitcoin onto Ethereum network to then have it within smart contracts um you know it was was just something that when that was originally launched didn't really gain traction um and what we've seen is last year in particular you know, the market cap of, of wbtc has just gone from you know a small number to i think what, what was i looking at this morning what 3.6 billion um which is a you know, huge percentage growth 
Uh, but ultimately, you know, that Bitcoin is stored somewhere and that Bitcoin is stored at a custodian. OK, it's a big go, but you know, there, there you go. Um, it, it's centralized in, in one place um, in, in an in a institution uh, that's storing the underlying asset. Mm -hmm. But again, it's, I mean, honestly, uh, I'm for CFI. I mean, CFI is a lot more positive. It's a lot more secure. And I, and I think that globally, people are seeing this trend, right? Uh, whether it's for custody, whether it's for savings accounts, whether it's for crypto-backed loans, right? Especially like crypto-backed loans. I mean, 2020 was a huge year and, and we can see a trend that that's massive, right? So Q1 2020, uh, there was about five billion dollars of collateralized uh, cryptocurrency overall in the market held by C5 companies. Q2 it was 10 billion. Q3 it was 15 billion. Q20 uh, sorry Q4 it was probably 20 billion. <laughs> uh, I mean the trend is clear and people are starting to realize that they have access to all these services. It's safe. Uh, they they compare companies such as ours to uh, traditional banks uh, and I mean we can see where the clear winners are or at least we can predict where the clear win winners will be in the long run yeah and there's more like on the banking side there's more of a convergence as well with I think now with 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 crypto and then um, you know neo banks or, or banks in in general than there was ever before um, mostly because there's more there's more players now in the market that will work with crypto companies and provide fiat services but you know, with what's going on, um, sort of in, in the world at the moment, uh, with you know QE and, and money printing, um, and you know changes in what we were sort of used to, um, you know, in the banking industry, that could kind of push those two together a lot more quickly. And I'm sure, Darren, Nick, you you spend a lot of time in banking, and uh, you probably see kind of where, where the changes are now between you know where banking is and kind of crypto will you know, possibly cross over with it. Yeah, I think you, you know, uh, my background's in a regulated environment in a bank for for many many years. Um, you, it, the banking industry, you know, the, the big kind of um, you know, big multi cap uh, you know, banks are, are, are facing a very difficult time. Um, you know, their their way of generating money has has kind of disappeared. They can't play the yield curve like they used to. The you know, rates are effectively zero or negative. Um, so they're, but but they are, you know, incredibly um, slow to move, and you'll find these neo banks coming along, which offer you know, banking, um, but also can actually move into the digital asset space very very quickly, um, and that's that's where I think is a, a really interesting um, avenue. But that being said, you are, and I know there's a lot of uh, you know, decent side banks that are doing underlying work with digital assets. Um, the challenge that these guys face is that there's still a bit of a credibility issue um, and, and, and maybe even a regulatory issue for them to touch digital assets. Um, so yeah, this is an opportunity for some of the neo banks to come in and straddle you know, traditional you know, fiat banking as well as you know, digital asset space and bring them together. We've seen a good few examples of, of companies doing that. Mm -hmm. It's like Revolut, right? So Revolut, but Revolut is, is sees it as wealth. So you can buy btc as like an asset but you can't use it for anything else which is probably as far as their compliance department would would take it i can't remember who's running revolutes um crypto business maybe it's you guys but um you know that that's as far as far as it will go where you know i'm, I'm sure like other more established and more traditional you know banking providers don't even you know want to didn't want to touch it before because it's too small and you know not really worth it um but you know how you explain to a compliance department a what it is, b why it has value, and then c what do you even do with it? Like that's you know how do you how do you buy it, um, and where do you store? It? Which obviously is where where something like Bitco comes in and it sort of bridges that gap really really well. But you know for for a lot of these institutions, just getting them, them to do a newsletter every month is is almost too much. Um, let alone taking on a new asset and storing it and, and then creating a product around it. Um, it's, it's not easy to do. And that's what people probably don't see is, you know, compliance is there for a reason, but some are, you know, um, not very backward, but super traditional. Yeah, I mean, Re Revolut got an interesting model. Um, you rightly say, um, you know, I kind of call it like fiat in, fiat out. And 
Yeah, so, yeah, if you want to buy yeah, Bitcoin, you obviously deposit fiat. Um, you buy Bitcoin synthetically. So, yeah, it is being replicated in a position that you can't physically take that Bitcoin out and you know, send it anywhere else. If you want to do that, you've actually then got to liquidate back out of it, um, back to fiat. And that, and that, as you as you pointed out, is is the you know, the standard traditional AML gateway, you know, in and in and out on the fiat. Um, so they've just kind of plugged in the crypto uh, engine in, in the in the back part of that. Um, but it, it kind of highlights where the industry faces, and you've seen this crop up in a number of different areas with the travel rule. Um, you know, regulators are, are looking very carefully on you know, assets moving across from wallet to wallet. Um, do they need to be identified? Um, source of funds. So, so regulation is is kind of looking at this, and you're seeing a whole new segment of um, businesses like Chain Analysis and Elliptic that do all this uh, you know, this analysis of where the coins have come from. Um, you know, have they been involved in dark web activity? Has it come from an op- an off act um, you know, uh, marked uh, uh, jurisdiction? Um, you know, these are all the things that any regulated entity is going to be absolutely terrified to receive it an asset, whether it's one Bitcoin and it's come from Iran um, or Iraq that's on the off back list is, is a massive problem. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. So but Revolut's, I mean, so I, I understand the whole compliance issue and I understand why Revolut did it and, and, and it's great, but it, it does kind of beat, beat the purpose, right? And it does kind of like, you, you, you've you invested, but you can't really participate in any of the market and any of the other opportunities that exist, like with Nimbus, like with Bitco, like with all, all of the other CFI companies. So I think it, it's a good starting point, uh, but I, I think people that kind of start using it or buy a bit of Bitcoin on, 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 on the Revolut, they quickly realize that, okay, well, we're going to start exploring other areas. They're going to start watching YouTube videos. They're going to start reading books and they're going to eventually uh, find a company that they like and they're going to find with it. Yeah. And it's a question yeah. of like who eats who first, right? And I'll give a, a, an anecdote I like because I'm a huge advocate of, um, you know, stable coins and how you can use them. Um, so looking at, again, a Revolut example. So they just issued um their savings accounts and you know take out like their introductory rate which is i think four and a half percent you know your your base rate is you know 0.5 percent um and in 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 a crypto capacity um if you did not want to suffer the asset fluctuations that we've seen in bitcoin where it goes from 20 to 40 and 40 to 30 um but still want to work within, within the ecosystem environment of crypto you could easily put this into usdt or USDC, and you know, with with the right provider and platform, you know, you see that yield go from 0.5 percent to eight and a half percent to 14 and a half percent. Which, again, if you can do that, then you you're kind of you know moving the the asset fluctuation price risk away. You're receiving a better yield on what is a a, a more stable you know currency, which is the which is the USD. Um, and you can easily spend this, um, which again is basically as a normal person, all you kind of want is a store of value and be able to spend it and grow, grow your, your money. Right. And that kind of, um, not saying crypto is going to eat the banks anytime soon, but, um, it makes a, a particularly interesting use case. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I guess brings the whole thing about, you know, central bank, digital currencies, stable coins, um, yeah, I, I've spoken to many family offices that are over the last few months um, you know, aggressively getting into Bitcoin um, purely on the basis of the uh, the macro picture. And the macro picture is very clear more than ever before now. Quantitative easing, dilution of our assets in, in the fiat world. Um, and here you have a, a protocol where you know, there's a fixed number or there will be a fixed number of, of coins. Um, it can't be QE. Um, so the question is then is that, you know, if you... If you're in Bitcoin and the central bank launch a uh, digital dollar, um, yeah, would you then say, right, I want to sell Bitcoin to go into the dollar? Or are you just literally going into a digital dollar with the same underlying problems that the uh, cash you know, fiat has um, because it's based on the same monetary system, i.e. it's being diluted and printed. Um, it doesn't solve the problem. Uh, but uh, yeah, at the same time, it, are we at the stage where we can spend bitcoin in different places easily i guess you can do it through certain cards 
Um, can you pay your mortgage off in Bitcoin? Not at the moment, easily. Um, yeah, there's still friction points in that, uh, that process, but it, it's definitely improving. Yeah, but I don't think today people want to spend Bitcoin anymore. Bitcoin is a store of value right now. It's, it's lost its, its uh, spending attractiveness. People want to buy it as an investment. Yeah, I, I, agree, I agree, which then means, you know, the, to receive an income or uh, a borrow against it is, is a really attractive because you don't want to give the, the whole concept of Bitcoin, you don't want to sell it. Um, and, this, and this is why we're seeing a new wave uh, of a very sophisticated, in the institutional, a very new wave of uh, sophisticated derivative products because these family offices and funds that have bought Bitcoin, they don't want to sell them, but they've, they want some utility out of it. And it may be a hedge. It may be a derivative strategy that, that um, is structured in a way that allows them to receive that. Um, and this is going back to actually CFI DeFi again, because you, here you have you know sophisticated institutions that are doing der structured derivative products, which is probably very similar to some of the products that are out in the, uh, the DeFi world that you, know, you and me and anyone on the street can get involved with. Mm. Yeah, which, which is true. That's why I call it sort of, a, 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 again, a sandbox for you know, advanced financial tools, because you do have um, synthetics and derivatives and fixed and float, you know, uh, bond uh, rates, you have all these, you know, for the lack of, you know, whether it's good or bad, like this, you know, yield farming and all these different things, um, which, which they're trying to do, which again is, is, is great, but the amount of effort that they've tried to get um, like a Bitcoin ETF going, which I think they may have just about done, which should have been done a couple of years ago, which just isn't happening. Having any sort of, you know, again, derivative or synthetic off of a cryptocurrency right now, which would definitely explode the market even more, um, is being, you know, tiptoed around by, by regulators, but is being sought after by these institutions, but the institutions will never touch uh, you know, a DeFi protocol spun up by, you know, two guys or, you know, 10 guys in a bedroom. It's just never going to happen. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, what actually happens is then, so institutions that can't touch the physical, you know, they go in and go buy CME futures. Um, and the biggest trade on CME futures is, is what we call basis. So that's the difference between, um, you know, the spot price and the actual futures price. So it's artificially high because when the market goes higher, you get institutions coming in, pushing the futures rate above the theoretical price where it should be versus spot. Um, so yeah, don't get too technical on that, but um, there, there is a cost for institutions to, to go in and buy these derivative products because they're effectively paying for yeah, a, a regulated framework, whether it's a CME um, or whatever the exchange is and derivatives. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a tricky one, but you're right. They're, they're not going to touch DeFi. Um, it's, it's just, it's just not a risk profile these guys are, or institutions are going to get involved with. Um, quick, quick question about, about growth. So um, obviously we know that there's a finite number, right, of, of, of Bitcoin. Right? They're being mined. Uh, the mining is going to stop, right? That all Bitcoins are going to be mined by 2142. So question about growth, right? Uh, what happens when we reach 2142? Obviously that's a long time away, right? But still, uh, like everything's mined, it's, it's 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 as if that's it. There's no there, there's no more to be produced. What happens? I think, yeah, I, I think from 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 my perspective, I don't think yeah the the the, the, the stopping of the the, the 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 effectively the creation of Bitcoin. Um, it, it clearly it's a positive thing because this is going back to that bigger macro picture of the, the it's not QEable, it's not you can't print more money, governments can't come in. Um, the bottom line here is that if you look at the market cap of investments in, in gold and, and what we see in Bitcoin, and Bitcoin is not even um, anywhere near its potential. And that it, we can talk about complex mathematics and, and forecasts, um, but you know, if we saw a small fraction of, of the, the, the concept of storing of gold, of all the benefits in digital asset, um, Bitcoin price is is multi magnitude multiples higher than where it could be. Um, and I don't I don't believe that you know, everything comes to a grind and halt once we reach that. You know, I think twenty one million, whatever the, the number is. Um, yeah, that's that's ultimately you know, hard coded in, and I think that's the attraction of the whole macro picture. Why people are buying it? Um, yeah, store of wealth that can't be diluted um, by governments or or any other you know, person. 
it's true that's that's uh, one of one of the key points i would say <laughs> uh, definitely um we are at about 35 minutes um let's start wrapping up uh this fireside chat but just to finish off again and and, and continue on what we were just uh, talking about uh about concerning growth right um so where, where is it heading in the short term obviously all of us have friends that have been calling us probably and asking us uh should we buy now uh do we sell now <laughs> when's the perfect time uh, bitcoin's going up especially in uh, like uh december and first week of january right it was just nuts um so what what are our what are your prediction guys predictions i i have no idea in terms of price target um but when it was like really, you know, kind of um, rocketing in, in December, um, I think we, if anyone's been following Bitcoin for a long time, we know that there's always, um, you know, periods of sideways movement. There's always sort of rapid price um, growth. And then there's a retraction, which I think we just kind of saw the next last couple of days that's gone from 40, you know, 40, whatever to around 30 or so, or whatever it is now. Um, but I think the, the one the one thing that's not quantifiable, but I know Darren and Bitco see on sort of a day to day basis is um, the amount of people that are holding this for the long term and seeing this as long term assets that are you know setting a foundation for the price of, of Bitcoin. Um, and a, a good example, an easy example is, is like a Ripple. Um, Ripple, uh, when, it, when it went up to like almost three bucks, it was predominantly retail. And yet everyone in every office in London saying, how can I buy this thing? I have no idea what it is, but it's going to go up to 10. Um, and then the price starts to slip and it gets dumped. And then the price you know, shoots way down. Um, and I think the more balancing forces that we have that are long-term holders, maybe both individuals and, and companies, the more we'll see this, I guess, hopefully progresses like a a more of a stable, stable thing, but um, maybe Darren, you got to have some thoughts on maybe where, where it could end up. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a really interesting topic. We could probably spend hours on, um, and, and, and yeah, my training experience of running a hedge fund um, for, yeah, for 10 years, the, the viewpoint from retail to investors, um, the trading style is very, very different. Um, we've seen this in a number of, it doesn't have to be Bitcoin. It could be, you know, equities, it could be foreign, it could be anything. Um, you know, retail are easily spooked into you know, moves, irrational moves. Um, and those irrational moves actually are for, for professional traders and institutions actually a way to, to create alpha or create profit on, on trades because it's irrational. It's human. You know, it's a fear and greed what you typically in the stock market. Um, what we've seen specifically, I would say, in the last six months is a seismic shift. And this is just talking from a big ghost perspective of who we talk to on institutions. Um, of very large sums of capital coming into the market with a very long-term view. This is not I'm buying X for, for one or two days and then getting out. This is I'm buying X for uh, you know, a concept, 10 year, 20 year, 30 year view. Um, and the best way to think about it is if you start to get lots of institutions and, and family offices or even high level individuals doing this, the, the, um, you're actually locking up a large part of the liquidity um, which means there's a natural tendency for irrational moves to be muted. So, you know, what you'll see is that, yes, there's always ups and downs, there's always periods of exuberance and, you know, despair. Um, I think as the market matures, you will see those moves, i.e. volatility, start to decrease. And I think you're starting to see, so, I mean, we've come a long way very quickly, so I think it was obvious that we're going to have a correction at some point. Um, but, you know, it, it, the, the breakthrough of 20,000, um it was very significant because it, it happened very very quickly um and and i think from you know we've got a firm but a firm base here with a very different investor base that we had a year ago yeah um it, it, in my personal opinion obviously i i, I think it's going to keep on growing um i totally agree with um let's say people are coming in and they're buying Bitcoin for long term, right? And, and that is going to affect the market. That is affecting the, mar the market. Um, the biggest, let's say, fear that I always had about Bitcoin, or I think, and I think this is the biggest fear that a lot of people have, is that, let's say, the stock market, you can kind of predict 
because you know the company, you know the CEO, you, you can kind of like read the roadmap of the products and if you're earning reports, right? And quarter earning reports, et cetera. Whereas um, crypto is, is purely uh, uh, like demand and, 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 and sell, that's it. Uh, and you can't really predict or forecast when a big institution is gonna buy a big sum of, of Bitcoin or Ethereum or anything or sell for that matter. And I think that's that's the biggest fear that people have. But I think that people are go overcoming that fear, and people are seeing crypto as a stable investment um, source, and people are doing it. And I think it's going to continue. Uh, the trend is going to continue 100%. I think the one thing I'd just like to add on that, um, you know, and and, I, and I've seen this historically over over a number of years, is that it, maybe not companies like Apple, but you know, blue chip um, you know, companies that through maybe insider corruption or accounting fraud, literally almost go to zero in a very, very short period of time. It's happened with um, household names over the last 10, 15 years. Um, it, it, we've seen 18, 90% correction. Um, people forget that. People forget, it, it, you know, you can get um, an Enron and, you know, all, all these other companies that, that, and they, they, that happen that where you have, um, you know, an accounting fraud, suddenly the value has gone overnight. Um, mm -hmm. But it, I, I take your point, but I, I do. From my perspective and what we're seeing, um, the institution and the long-term holders, I think, dramatically changes dynamics of the market going forward. Mm. It's true. It's true. <laughs> I agree with you there, and I forgot about that point. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I didn't forget about that point, but it's just... Uh, uh, it's good that you pointed it out. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's human nature. We only focus on the short term, and uh, you know that that's part of, I guess, trading. You know, that's why the old traders out there seem to remember all the all the crazy stuff that went on in two thousand eight, two thousand nine, which we all seem to have now forgotten about. Um, the, the yeah, the yeah. dot com, dot com, and everything. <laughs> and and yeah, two thousand two thousand one, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and and a lot of people are comparing that to, to today. Is is today a, a, a similarity equivalent to the dot com bubble? Is is it going to burst? And 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 this applies to both, uh, well, to all investment worlds, right? I think uh, crypto stocks, etc. Um, people are asking these questions, and um, we'll see. But that that's a different topic. We can continue for hours on this. <laughs> All right, you guys, um, thank you so much. Uh, thanks to everyone who joined. Uh, Darren, thank you so much for joining the Fireside Chat. Peter, thank you for your input. Um, we'll speak to you soon and stay tuned for the next Fireside Chat. <laughs> thank you for having me. Take care, everybody. All right, Bye. thank you. Bye-bye.